All right. Thank you. <coughs> thank you all for coming. You're welcome. Welcome to the uh, the third event of the Holloway Holloway Poetry uh, Series and the fall uh, fall lineup of readers. Uh, tonight we're, we're honored to have have George Stanley who's come down from uh, from from Vancouver to read. Uh, reading reading first will be Mary Musman, uh, one of our, our graduate students, and Mary Musman will be introduced by uh, Max Keisler. And following uh, following Mary Musman's reading. Uh, Laura Ritland will introduce introduce George Stanley, so I'll get out of, out of the way and uh, Max Geisler. Hello, can you all hear me? Okay. No. Okay. How about this? Is this better? Excellent. Um, hello, I'm Max Geisler, and tonight it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce my dear friend Mary Mussman. Uh, you know run-of-the-mill sort of introduction material. Mary graduated from Yale University where she studied literature and worked under the tutelage of Louise Glick. Here at Berkeley, she's a doctoral student in comparative literature where she translates Greek, Latin, uh, I should say ancient Greek, Latin, and French texts, exploring the intersections of the lyric, loss, and desire. Uh, I should say that this impressive shorthand account of Mary's academic career does not begin to do justice to the luminous grace of her poetry, which speaks to us from the same Parnassus of giants such as Sappho, Anne Carson, and Mallarmé. Her poems engulf mm -hmm. us in a kind of afterglow, alternately elegiac, satirical, and transcendent. There's an incidental character to Mary's poems, as if any of life's phenomena closely examined might suddenly burst into flame, into soot in our faces. If we were to lose the world as we know it and forced to recreate another from the images of Mary's poems alone, ours would be, I would argue, one of the best of all possible worlds, an enchanted, flammable one where we might, quote, find ourselves among harps and finials and the shades in a place where incandescent desire and the dark matter of loss converge luminously. Please join me in welcoming the truly incomparable Mary Mussman. Thank you, Max. Um, and thank you, Jane and Mary and other coordinators of the Holloway Group and George Stanley for being here. Can Am I heard at the back? So much okay. um, I will speak loudly. Um, for Rachel in London, for her weeks in hell, a night of sleeplessness and little to show for it except the molten sunrise with cold air and three paragraphs on Eros, writing to realize patterns in Greek so be, that being touched by you, I may, whomever Eros touches, 1,000 lines between. I recorded my thoughts in a letter. I am drunk. We were on the farm, and I had never seen the sunrise, fluidity in ancient breathings, rough or smooth. Cathexis, from the Greek word for retention, a psychological term salient here as a description of what has changed. Let me write clearly, harrowed eyelids, it was a night like lace wings, somewhere peripheral. Absences left by a lover, the hope of seeing an old friend, one who is far from here and far from London, far from Plato's symposium. Rachel, come visit, it is cold here and far too late in the night. Mm -hmm. Desert poem. I smell the wet clay you are spinning into vases. You are waiting for someone to bring bright cactus flowers to put in them. You look up, you are blowing on the end of my cigarette. This happens every so often, and I don't mind it so much. A story about a man who pressed his thumbs into the skin on your chest, leaving red clay marks. You are still laughing. 
the kiln is hot. You rinse the clay from your hands, push them into a rag hanging from one of the hooks. My cigarette has gone out, tossed into the desert. You, you who take coffee with slices of lime. The morgue, one. The girl observes a cup filled with tea made from Queen Anne's lace, also known as wild carrot. The flour inverted, steeped in hot water, tasting like carrot tea. Well, she says, carrot tea was what it was. Two, a sheet had been draped over the portrait. The wooden drawers in the basement have been lined with parchment. Only ever stillness, oil sets, the amber of the Baroque epic. Three, it used to be that the painting was on the wall, and the sunlight through the thick window panes and all of the dark made the girl's face look sallow. No one wanted to look at her then, tea or no tea. Four, oils dry by oxidation, the continuous loss of electrons over the course of the artist's life or longer. Sometimes the oil adds hues of its own, for example, the girl's blush. Five, I want to talk about the carrots. Not much to say though, except about how the flower of it is called an umble, related by its roots to the idea of a small shadow, a small carrot shadow. Our brief and opulent affair. The first of two times we bathe together, I slip under the water, rinse irises from myself. You listen to my thoughts about a friend's imminent death. You see, you never wash your hair. In Los Angeles, we hunt down taco trucks, sit with quesadillas on a curb on our left, an art opening with white walls, white lights when I return north, lights pinprick firs in the hills. During most hours, I speak with you. You say the word reductive. And then long evenings in a silk robe, my lost mother's reading George Eliot about floods. I have one more poem. Um, and before I read this one, I um, should say that it is, I wrote it for Max Ritvo, a friend of mine who just over five weeks ago um, uh, died of terminal cancer, and he is, was a poet, a great poet. Um, and so this is a very recent poem, but there's a sort of urgency in my reading it. So that is looming in the background um, for Max different Max, Max Rippo. Um, Greek poetry composition. In Greek poetry composition, we learn to write in the lesbian Aeolic dialect, the first symptom of which is silosis, a kind of forgetting to breathe or a loss of breath. The lesbian Aeolic dialect is not a literary one, but the normal usage at the time what we have surmised from its residue on papyri and elsewhere, mostly Sappho, mostly Alcaeus. It was two poets who enfolded me into ancient Greek, my first great loves. Let us call one Sappho and the other Alcaeus, lesbian poets or pseudo-lesbians. In published works, Sappho and Alcaeus discuss the space within which reading ancient Greek takes place. There is the requisite physical space upon one's desk of texts, commentaries, dictionaries, a lamp since it gets dark. And the mind is separate from anything else, stutters, falters, halts, stumbles through the salt flax flats of archaic text. In brief, it is the experience of deep space, 
a sensory deprivation chamber like nothing else. It is nighttime with the woman I've been dating and our lesbian friend who convinces me to inhale my first and only cigarette. She invokes Sappho and her deep space of ancient Greek. This is unfair. As you know, it is like nothing else, she says. I take her cigarette in my hand. I choke on my own coughs. The cigarette is a lesbian aeolic euphemism for the three of us fucking a few hours later, a little breathless island of lesbos, senseless mind. When Max dies, it is Alcaeus who tells me. I crumple into ancient texts. Time passes, I call him on the telephone. Are you okay, he says. We muse on Max's earliest email to us, in which Max called Alcaeus a caryatid and called my diction Wolfian. I say, Max is the reason I could love you. Loving Alcaeus was a kind of deep space dwelling in the same phylum, the phylum of my desk strewn with the lesbian aeolic dialect. I know, he says, but he no longer dwells in deep space, describes Sappho as bones. The last part is that what we learn in Greek poetry composition is a form of astrophysics. Despite its apparent futurity, astrophysics is not a way of thinking about the future, but the study of the movement of old things in deep space, like dark matter or Sappho. It is a form of grief. What astrophysicists detect is only ever ancient, ancient particle waves that have lasted across deep space that leave residue on our senses. a George Stanley poem. Mm -hmm. Well, for starters, you can abandon the idea of a house. I don't think Stanley's poems are even consent, con content to sit still in pubs or bars, though they do now and then with a good drink and the sports channel on. If you enter a Stanley poem, you're more likely to find yourself walking, maybe along California Street or just north of it, down the brick sidewalks of Vancouver's gas town, the avenues of Terrace, British Columbia, Likely you'll find yourself on a bus, or waiting for one, your fellow passengers' lives suddenly as intimate to you as the idea you held so preciously about yourself and who you are. Stanley's poems enact a form of presentness and grounded living, where to be anywhere, to live, is to be part of a particular place in a shifting scale of time. Poems like San Francisco's Gone and Vancouver a Poem feature a speaker's transit with the grammar of changing cities, their cultures, their landscapes, their felt histories, to bring us into a deeply embodied sense of what it means to inhabit here. What is my relation to the city I am not at home in? And for what angle to expose it so that maybe I could fall in love with it? Expose some side of it as if the city were a man but not my man, the speaker wonders in Vancouver, a poem. Stanley's work asks these questions about the netted relationships between subjects and places, and also answers them through his poem's acts of experiential knowing. Stanley's career itself reflects a passage across geographies. Born in San Francisco, San Francisco, Stanley's peers and mentors in the 50s included the likes of Jack Spicer, Robert Creeley, Robin Blazer, Robert Duncan of the San Francisco Renaissance. He attended Spicer's influential Poetry as Magic work workshop and published his first book of poems, Pony Express Writers with White Rabbit Press. In 1971, Stanley moved to British Columbia, living in Terrace and Vancouver, where he taught at both Northwest Community College and Capilano University. His works include A Tall Serious Girl, winner of the 2006 Shelley Memorial Prize from the Poetry Society of America, St. Andy's, Gentle Northern Summer, Vancouver, A Poem, After, After Desire, 
and most recently, North of California Street, Selected Poems, 1975 to 1999, published by New Star Books. In her introduction to North of California Street, Sharon Thiessen writes that Stanley's poems concern themselves with their unfolding content, ideas, thoughts, locales, occasions, persons, and words. Indeed, in innovating the long poem form, Stanley's work embraces vast and heterogeneous swaths of experiences, inhabiting the landscapes of cities and towns as a way of drawing attention to seeing how ideology or class structure, class structure our view of the world, or how we might better see through and challenge those structures. They mourn the loss of a bohemian protest and revolution that defined an er earlier period of American and Canadian culture. And they remind us in that morning of the intense importance to continue, to continue to reimagine and fight for an openly self-questioning mode of relating to others. Though he'd probably dislike the plumped up grandiosity of these claims, his impact on the poetry scenes of both San Francisco and British Columbia cannot be underestimated. Younger generations of poets in Canada are still running in his tracks, in love with the same political urgency and frankly voiced per personal intimacy that made and makes his work so celebrated in the poetry community and beyond. It's a pleasure to claim Stanley as a great poet on both sides of the border, both itinerant and leader, seeker and critic, teacher and creator, whose work continues to propel us to reimagine what it means to live, what it means to live here, Please welcome George Stanley. Thank you, Laura. I do want to meet those young British Columbia poets who are following in my footsteps. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to thank the English Department of the University of California for inviting me, and particularly Cecil Giscombe. I'm very happy to be here with, with uh, members of my family and with uh, poet friends of, of whom I've loved for many years. When I was a young poet in North Beach, I used to come to uh, Berkeley to visit Josephine Miles at her home here. And uh, <coughs> I think, uh, not jokingly, I would say that, that Joe Miles uh, showed me something of the higher informality of the, the conversational register in poetry. So I'd like to dedicate my reading this evening to the memory of Josephine Miles. In the summer of 1999, I was in Veracruz, Mexico, having my lunch in the Pink Panther Cafe, when a poem began unreeling in my brain so I went back to my hotel, wrote it down. It was the most uh, completely dictated poem I had ever received. And I thought of it as a one-off. Read it a couple of times uh, at readings. But then it occurred to me, no, it's not a, it's not a one-off. It is, in fact, the 16th and final poem of a serial poem that I had written 10 years before called San Francisco's Gone. So I'd like to read two of the earlier parts of San Francisco's Gone, and then Veracruz. So this is San Francisco's Gone, parts four, nine, and 16. Four, the time frame is 1918 to the early 20s. George, there was a photograph, part of his face in slanting shadow, the mouth obscure was in the Navy, was out in the Atlantic once on a destroyer, but not far, nowhere near the U-boats. The war for improvement, like the Panama Canal. At Pelham Bay Naval Station, New York, he had the flu, discharged in 19, sailed for home, and to return to his widowed father, George Albert Stanley, civil engineer and grand secretary of the Young Men's Institute, the Catholic Y, club and baths at 50 Oak Street, living in an apartment on Turk or Octavia, check the city directory. The ex-sailor was George Anthony Stanley, the friar patron of lost belongings exchanged 
for the prince consort, and that was his mother, Molly McCormick's gift. Now that's a mistake. <laughs> um, my brother has informed me it isn't even certain that my grandfather's middle name was Albert. <laughs> and if it was Albert, it was probably unlikely that that name had been chosen with reference to Victoria's prince consort, more likely St. Albert the Great. Did Marie tell me he wrote poetry? Or that en route he stayed several days, a sojourn, or was it just a shore visit, a few hours in Havana, Cuba, and thought of not coming back, but going on to Brazil? Because that's where I imagine him, a serious, a dreamy, <coughs> dark, narrow-headed boy with stiff black hair. I see him at a table, marble top, in a sidewalk cafe, or walking the malacone into a summer wind, but can't imagine how he imagined that break, what image, song, or deeper will called him, but instead returned to the Grand Secretary who lives at the William Taylor Hotel on McAllister and takes all his meals out now, accompanied by his boy, and a job on the front desk at the St. Francis. Emmett invites him up to his mother's place on 11 Carl, at 11 Carl. In the front room, Ma plays the upright, a vigorous bass, tr bright treble, plinking above high C, rippling streams. Then the girls gather round, chorusing, for it was Mary, Mary, long before the fashion came. And the men, in good clothes, seated on Mamie's mahogany furniture, served cake and claret. <clears throat> Nine. Once on the streetcar, the L, going downtown, a sunny Saturday, maybe the fall of 47, him 48, me 13, head spent an intense conversation in the dark, varnished seats at the back of the car. It had begun even before we sat down, taking transfers from the conductor. Were we going to the ball game? I could tell he wanted out that he looked toward San Diego, we had spent a couple of weeks there that summer, as he had to Brazil. There were breezes and shadows, the Iron Monster rolled smoothly along Market from Castro to Sanchez. He had a gray hat on with the snap brim turned up all around. We wore thin McGregor jackets, gray or beige. We were almost friends. He told me what it meant to be George Stanley with only wit as a plea. He tried to pass on to me the name Anthony, his mother had found to replace the alien Albert. Well, maybe not alien. He wanted me to be Tony. It fit the land, he said, like mission architecture. Women liked it. I could not take that talisman happiness from him. Loyally, I chose to continue his fuck up. <laughs> Sixteen, Veracruz. In Veracruz, city of breezes and sailors and loud birds, an old man, I walked the Malacone by the sea, and I thought of my father who, when a young man, had walked the Malacone in Havana, dreaming of Brazil. And I wished he had gone to Brazil and learned magic. And I wished my father had come back to San Francisco armed with Brazilian magic, and that he had married not my mother, but her brother, whom he truly loved. I wish my father had, like Theresius, changed himself into a woman, and that he had been impregnated by my uncle and given birth to me as a girl. I wish that I had grown up in San Francisco as a girl, a tall, serious girl and that eventually I had come to Veracruz and walking on the Malacone I had met a sailor, a Mexican sailor or a sailor from some other country, maybe a Brazilian sailor, and that he had married me and I had become pregnant by him so that I could give birth at last 
to my son, the boy I love. <laughs> San Jose poem. This is a poem that goes back and forth in time from the 80s to the 30s and then back to the 80s. It's in six unnumbered sections. I'll, I'll simply pause. For Catherine Hennessy, parenthesis, sister Maureen, and also mother Maureen, close parenthesis, 1908-1985. Starting in April, sadness carried forward from Catherine's death, which I have not mourned in April, in April's sadness. How the city of San Jose stands in my mind, the B of A with its, with its bell-less tower, hot 5 p.m., walking east on Santa Clara, cross market and first, preserved facades, south between second and third, sun on car roofs, blocks raised to keep Mexicans from crossing. Some stores left hang banners in Vietnamese. South of Keys were orchards. Sunday afternoons we drove to orchards, a gray DeSoto or Dodge sedan, moving slowly down gravel roads quarter sections of trees geometrically spaced, watered the gray coast hills beyond. Visitors, we parked in front of a small barn, were allowed to walk in among the trees, reached into our hands and mouths, Santa Clara plums, a sweet green fig, ripe apricots. Our friends gave us balsa cartons to take fruit back to the city. Catherine came to San Jose as superior of the convent, her last assignment. Twelve years she had been superior of the order. At her funeral mass, Gerald said in his homily, she was not one of the foolish virgins, nor would she have been one of the sensible virgins either, refusing oil to her foolish sisters, telling them to go downtown to buy some. <laughs> she would have been in the Lord's house already, placing a glass of ginger ale and a cookie in the room of each one arriving home late as she came to the side door of the Hayes Street Convent in San Francisco with wax paper sandwiches of cabbage and mashed potato for men who lined up in the Depression. Catherine entered the Sisters of the Holy Family in 1930. The order, since 1872, patronized by Irish banks, established day homes for children of poor in San Jose cannery workers. The fruit left by train. The trees sucked the water out of the ground and it left as fruit. Water in a well, Santa Clara and Delmas, 150 feet, 1950. The sisters lived in underheated California Baroque luxury, mahogany, <laughs> mahogany paneling. Sister Thomasine held me as a child. Last year, Sister Daniel, her sister, served shrimp salads, steaks, rolls, ice cream, and coffee to Catherine and me in the superior's dining room. These people are still alive and live on St. Elizabeth's Drive in San Jose, and they are dead and live in this poem with the often repetitive movements of the dead drawing in a skirt just so as to be remembered in rooms filled with spring sunlight and my mother's spotless furniture. Leaving the convent, dazed, dazzled by goodness, I'd go back to the Holiday Inn generously contemptuous of the ones who ate avocado salads in the Hawaiian coffee shop or played video games in the black alcove. 
And on leaving the inn, walk up Almaden, past the offshore banks, the orchards burnt and dozed when electronics came. Think of recent Santa Clara grads hoping to retain the software concession, steal the yup trade from Mountain View, fill the new Civic Center with suits, music, beds of flowers, and sprinklers. In the old day homes, these virgins were my mothers. I was treated as poor. On the polished hardwood floor, rolling in play pants, in black habit and stiff white cloth, Thomasine bends to offer panuche on a glass plate. Downstairs, admitted to the working areas, the stone floored kitchen, Sister Malachi supervising, two Spanish women baking, door open on a walled garden, a red or yellow watering can, geraniums, tall bending stalks of snapdragon. Catherine remembers me asking questions. Is it all right? No, my mother's voice. Is it all wrong? Nuns smiling. One eternal moment, the content of the other as we sit talking. So I moved to uh, Vancouver and a few years after moving to Vancouver I got a job teaching English at a community college in a town called Terrace about 400 miles north of Vancouver. Now, during those years in Vancouver, I never felt that I was in another, another country. Vancouver, of course, in many ways, is a city like Seattle or San Francisco. But when I got to that town 400 miles north of Vancouver, I knew I was in another country, Canada. Mm. In fact, Ontario, because, it, it, because the town is, 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 it was founded by Ontario settlers, and modeled on Ontario towns. So a couple of years after, and I of course was, was trying to understand the new, the new land I was living in, and also trying to understand Canadian literature. And a, a couple of years later, uh, after having been there a couple of years, I began to, uh, to attempt to write a poem that expressed some of what I thought, if, if, even if perhaps superficially, I learned about this new land I was living in. This is called Gentle Northern Summer. It's in three parts. Looking out window at neighbors spread, vast spaces bourgeois think they deserve. Why judge? What do I care? Later on the grass, gentle northern summer, do I face my uncaringness when my mind is filled with you? In this gentle time of trees and bees and clover, feel a wordless reprobation to discover behind their placid faces and doors a secret that unites them willy-nilly with the coal trains coming five years down the road. Coal dust on leaf and air, in nostril and ear, 500 mile long smudge. The coal trains were unit trains, uh, 100 car trains, each car containing 100 tons of coal from the, from the coal fields in, eastern, in northeastern British Columbia to be that offloaded at, at the port of Prince Rupert and then people thought well now the cars coming clanking back to the coal fields so all the coal dust would fly out of them onto all the trees and rock faces thus creating a 500 mile long smudge but this, <laughs> there was no smudge the cars returning from the coal port were sprayed with fixative a mile from the tracks, you don't notice the whistle and the buzz and hum of insects and reliable appliances. Nor 4,000 miles east do New York bankers coming out the glass doors of their Park Avenue ziggurats see any coal dust either in the edited texture of events their eyes pick up. 30 kilometers south, my neighbor F's pickup crosses the red cantilever bridge over the, Cat over the Kitimat River and speeds up the hill and as he makes the turn at the top he takes in the view of the Kitimat Valley, mountains and mist, splendid 
takes it home with him. In fact, it's part of his lifestyle. But the clear cuts that hang over us like swaths made by the teeth of aliens are not part of the views we appropriate. They are external. The scraped slopes, evidence, value, wrapped up somewhere, some big account. Haul it out and then we'll go mining. And the ranch houses stay put, tame trees on the lawn, on the crimeless streets. Two, and this part is set in a, another town 160 miles east of Terrace called Houston for Daniel. At a table in the old Houston hotel. Each time, Vivian said, people got moved out of the way. Indians, then farmers, then came the mill and mine, and now, swinging her arm wildly, that mall that none of them know what's happening to them. The real Trojan horse, Spicer wrote, was Greek sentence structure. The Trojans never knew what hit them. <laughs> People of this north will have to change their ways, some newspaper. Who counts the changes? A child growing up in Houston, say, to Indians, bear and moose, swimming across the river to the hippie houses, and their eyes told what had moved them to teenage void and foreseeing heavy industry, knocking the moly out of the mountains, not Homer's herb that kept men sane, protected from being turned to pigs, but silver grit that hardens steel for war to see who will control these malls, these stalls. He sees the bland and bowed consumer heads in Alibaba's cave, past the tumbled piles of glittery cloth, cold sparkle of death games, pink Mexican fruit, their eyes all inward turned on private catalogs. At the checkout stand, he sees the illusion and the cash change hands with thank you on both sides. The former goes eventually to the dump of things that cease to charm. The cash goes to Vancouver by computer and sees we are the natural resources that mix our hands with the earth and drive from mill to mall to spend our pay, the suckers at the breast of dreams. If all this were brought down quite suddenly, he'd say people would rise up in anger, but with no world to compare it to. And it done slickly, equipment moved on site, oil, the go-ahead archival by the time the wheels turn. And if they dare, the system, the tangled boundary that has no place in what we learn as place, deflates at every encountered point, draws back with a gasp at being unappreciated, dangles some plastic goodies in our faces, some go-kart, and off we go, gaily in the snow, follow the moose droppings. Then it swells up again, aggrieved but deferent, gets to work, pumping, Value. Three, back in Terrace. Looking out the window, I can see nothing of the life I'm buried in. Slippage, moraine. The ranch houses, like a row of broken columns, tame trees on the lawn. Behind them, the half-wild second growth in their hundreds, hemmed in by the bench. More houses in the air, some for sale. It is so still and dreamlike. To get one more tank full of gas, I drive to the pump. Like my neighbor, I accede to the coal trains coming, the rearming of Japan, whatever. The secret is not in the picture. It is in some close-up of our lives that we cannot see, smeared over us like a recurring decimal. Okay, back in Vancouver. Uh, for a couple of years, I lived with a couple of younger guys and their dogs in a flat which we called the monastery. 
Abner. I'd trade places with him in a minute, said the young monk of the chocolate speckled Catahoula hound rolling at his feet. You don't think much of being human, said the old fox. No, I don't. You do, but you're an artist. Without art, you're an animal. And was out the door, dog at heels. That hound is Abner. He lives at the monastery with four other dogs. One, a white female boxer pup with a brown eye patch. The other three, bipeds, monks. <laughs> And Abner sniffs them all every morning to know them, sometimes several times in one morning. It's not just recognition. There's more novelty in it, as there is in the morning. Meanwhile, the rain, the hail of information continues. The monks sit at the kitchen table reading the Globe and Mail. It tells them how stupid they are not to understand their true nature. Born to compete, boys. Born to lose, say the monks. It's not just the bondholders have you by the short hairs, it's your attitude. If the Globe and Mail could be translated into doggish, would Abner wonder, compete? For food? For love? Abner fights with Des, the boxer, for chew toys, tug of war with the old mop head, but that's just play not dog-eat-dog. Dog. The monks compete. They compete with monks from other monasteries. The dogs howl when they're gone, howl with loneliness. They don't know what time it is. Hours, days, months, centuries pass. Then suddenly the door opens. Ecstatic, the dogs leap up, try to climb the monks, lick their faces, Abner is so happy he wags his tail so hard there are blood spots the whole length of the hall, Abner height. The young monk talks to him. If my arms were four legs, if my hands were paws, I'd drop to the ground and be a dog like you. I'd sniff the world. But whose world would it be, the old fox thinks, emerging from his den. But you'd just like to be up here reading the paper, eating your dinner with a knife and fork, and talking away like me. The fox thinks it's not exactly the moment to defend humanity or the dog's dim desire to escape eternity such as it is when he himself has been drinking whiskey and reading philosophy to get down. <laughs> Okay, I'll read a few more recent poems. The first uh, four of them, I guess. Are from a, a uh, serial poem called After Desire. Beauty. At a sushi joint I went to infrequently, there was a waiter I called Beauty. I was tickled by his dark eyes and his lip and his hip length black apron. I thought his dad must have been Russian, he was so tall. He only ever served me once. When I'd pass by the restaurant, I'd always look in to see if beauty was there. There was another waiter, looked like beauty, sometimes at first. I think he was beauty, but then he'd come toward the window, showing some customers to a table, and I could see it wasn't beauty. Sometimes I couldn't tell right away because of the reflections of cars in the windows, and I was afraid if I peered in too intently, beauty would see me and know. One night I took beauty home. Took. His long legs loped up the stone steps ahead of me. I unlocked the door to my apartment and followed him in. 
But when we were face to face, I didn't know what to do with him. I didn't want to hurt him anymore. I didn't want him to take me in his arms anymore. So I let him vanish. I let him go. I let him go back to his body. I let him escape the violent eye that fastens on beauty to possess or destroy. The phantoms have gone away. The phantoms have gone away and left a space for beauty. And the freedom from desire leaves a stillness, a moment when you believe. This is that moment. Visions of beauty in an unfamiliar stillness. They can be spoken to, called by name. Desire will not drag them home. And this next short poem is a poem of exactly 36 syllables. And I didn't fudge it. it just came out that way. I did not add or subtract a <laughs> syllable. 36 syllables with a cesura after the first 18. Jack. Jack, dead at 40, sees me, 73, in the boring bar, waiting for something to happen. There isn't even a game on, just poker stars. Jack, dead at 40, sees me, 73, in the boring bar, waiting for something to happen. There isn't even a game on, just poker stars. And this is... Desire for the self. Laugh in surprise at beauty. Laugh at your freedom from desire. The boy boarding the bus may even flash you a smile. Thanks for not wanting me. Take this stillness without desire and breathe it. But there's one boy you won't shrug off, and that's the self. Desire wakes at the self. You follow him home. You look like one duplicated figure with four legs trucking down Broadway. The self sets the pace and you follow. The step behind keeping step with the step ahead, the foot, the leg, the torso. But this guy too is not playing your game. Turn yourself to your face, your face to yourself, it's the same rueful smile. Don't you get it yet? Feel the stillness. The abyss doesn't open. It's all right to stand on the earth, in your own bedroom even, and know yourself doesn't want you. But alas, there's a third the desirophile. Nervous as hell, next to his reflection in the bank window, alert to the hint of desire. And when the desirer goes after the self, he goes after the desirer. Now it's a six-legged creature out of R. Crumb or Smokey Stover, step after step after step. And behind the desirophile, a whole string of desirophiles. <laughs> okay, I have two more poems. This one is such a cheerful poem that I was surprised I ever received it. <laughs> one I think that Josephine Miles would have liked too. The vacuum cleaner. I'd almost finished the vacuuming when the on-off switch that had been wonky for months, finally broke. I couldn't turn the machine off. It was stuck on on. So I finished vacuuming and unplugged it. 
Next week, I took it into the shop. A beautiful girl came out from in back. I handed her the vacuum cleaner, the power head, that is, the attachments I had left at home. And as she inspected it, we began to talk in a friendly way about what I don't remember, but I recall feeling that I was not just a customer to her. The beauty of girls and boys pursues me wherever I'm going. Then I had to take my head in to the clinic. <laughs> I sat in the examining room waiting for the door to open. Then it did. The young doctor entered and said, I'm Jason. <laughs> All right, so the last poem. The last poem is the translation. Actually, a, an imitation in the Robert Lowell sense of imitation from the great Russian poet Alexander Pushkin written in 1829 when Pushkin himself was 29 years old. Uh, and it begins with a very brief three-word epigraph from Czeslaw Milos. Fair, well, nature. Dedicated to Stan Persky. And the lions mentioned in this poem are two iconic mountain peaks visible from downtown Vancouver long after Pushkin. Whether, whether I walk the discordant mall or enter a crowded pub to watch the game, wedged in at the bar amid rowdy fans, my mind won't let me be. Once again it gets my age wrong, then corrects me, it tells me no matter how many of us are still walking around, we all must descend, and that just today a friend has been diagnosed. Gaze on the lions, snowy or bare, and know they'll be there, unshakably, when people have started to forget my name, as I now forget the names of some of my elders. If with a young poet I discuss his new poem, some part of my mind already thinks farewell. Take my place, I say, it's time for me to rot, for you to shine. I have got into the habit of saying good night to each day at bedtime and volley to the years, but I am incurious as to which calendar date will be that of my death day. Nor do I wonder where I will die, in downtown traffic, on a ward at St. Paul's, or will the building manager unlock the door to find what had been me cold and fallen? A dead body can neither know nor feel the trip it takes to be buried or burned, but I recall, yet I recall smiling, being driven past the old terrace graveyard above the Skeena. Pushkin envisioned a sunny grave, a place where children might come to play, I fantasize a green wave of nature rising to overtop the towers of the city. Thank you. <laughs>